price to pay to pursue your dreams Grinding every day to get that dream Ain't no holding back until you get your shot One day you gonna open your eyes and be on top That's the price you pay to pursue your dreams Grinding every day to get that dream Ain't no holding back until you get your shot One day you gonna open your eyes and be on top I've been playing this game since I was 10 years of age I wanted to make my mark ever since my pop won the days When I strapped that helmet I'm knocking dudes into a blaze A lockdown corner going all the way through 7th and 8th grade Entering high school, I'm ready to write another page Busting my ass and lifting weights It's a much higher level, but I'm still making plays No time to party or bask in my glory days It's college preparatory classes every single day Living my life with that singular goal It's the fire inside that makes me whole Looking in the mirror, my muscles swole I'm on a mission and I'm never gonna stop When the ball's in the air like Sherman, I'm a hawk And I promise I'll overcome whatever life throws at me All right, good afternoon everyone And welcome to the Ageless Movement Podcast I'm your co-host Scott I'm saying All right, glad we established that Okay, so this week's topic And this is something that people ask me all the time What is better at building muscle? kettlebells or dumbbells and my first thought on that whole subject is this what do you mean build muscle because that's a funny thing to say because are you just talking about looking like a bodybuilder and trying to build as much muscle as you can or are you talking about function athleticism developing power versus stability it's not an easy answer and I always get kind of annoyed when people ask me that question. Rather, I wish they would ask me, what are the benefits of kettlebells? What are the benefits of dumbbells? And can they help me? I think that's the better question, the, the way to frame it. You know what I mean? So, what is your thoughts on that? I'm sure people have asked you that so many times since you're the kettlebell expert. <laughs> so, that's, that's the funny part. I think, if anything... Um, Scott's skill set is really in using dumbbells. If somebody were to ask me that, it's not even a question. Like, <laughs> I'm like, my whole, I spent years doing workouts with nothing but a kettlebell. I have built muscle only using a kettlebell. Um, <laughs> but that's not entirely true. You built a lot of muscle lifting barbells and dumbbells. No, but I'm just saying, well, initially my first year... Oh, yes, yes, just, yes, yeah. In order to lose weight, yeah. I did all kettlebell, and yeah. that's how I the, mm -hmm. I initially gained muscle was through using kettlebells. Sure. Um, and it helped me lean out, um, and then I moved to barbell once I realized, oh, I can really lift a lot of weight. Um you become limited with kettlebells because, I mean, there's no way to increase weight other than to go buy another kettlebell. <laughs> so that becomes a very expensive <laughs> solution. So that's when I moved to barbells for a couple of years. Yeah, and you did really well. You got your strong first uh, certification, which for those of you who don't know and aren't familiar with strong first, um, it's like the RKC, the Russian Kettlebell um, Club. To get a certification with them, you have to not only um, show that you cognitively are aware of all the techniques and everything, but you have to pass physical tests. And Sang had to bench a certain amount, she had to deadlift a certain amount, she had to squat a certain amount, and then they threw in this one lift I absolutely am against, the military press. That will be another topic in the future, about how it wrecks shoulders. <laughs> and, and I think that's a good segue into starting this discussion. Because, you know, somebody asked me that question, and I've thought about this a lot. Um, kettlebells, dumbbells. I, you know, I am not an absolutist when it comes to exercise. I feel like everybody has their own specific goals about what they want to achieve in fitness. And I would say this, um, dumbbells, I would say, are very effective for increasing stability, uh, also hypertrophy. I think kettlebells, there's nothing better than kettlebells for developing power. 
And I think it's the safest way to develop power because unlike a barbell, you're not required to have a high degree of thoracic mobility. And for those of you that maybe didn't catch our um, podcasts on posture and spine, it's basically the upper middle back is the thoracic area. And I happen to be one of those people that structurally struggle with thoracic mobility. And I could never make it as an Olympic lifter because I simply cannot hold a bar behind my head with perfect range of motion and not use my spine to do it. So I'm not a good candidate for Olympic lifting. And I'm gonna tell you, that's what makes those athletes so special is because not only are they strong enough to physically lift a lot of weight, but they have incredible amounts of mobility. And anybody that's ever built a lot of muscle in their life will understand that the more muscle you put on, you have got to be careful about your quality of movement because it's very easy to start limiting your uh, mobility. And they are the epitome of people that can lift heavy weight and maintain what I consider yoga-like, yogi-like mobility. So I have nothing but praise and respect for Olympic lifters. And more so as I've gotten older and I've understood training more. Um, and then he, here's the thing I always point out, and, and I've talked to strength coaches in football, and I tell them all the time, you know, you should always consider teaching your football players um, the snatch and the clean with kettlebells. And the reason is, you can't tell me the majority of every football player has great thoracic mobility. We know that's not true. I mean, some of the linemen look kind of weird sometimes. They're so big and some of them don't move like the running backs do. I don't know if it's, if it's the smartest thing to have a guy like that trying to do a snatch when uh, he may not have the mobility to do that. And I'm not just talking football players. I mean, you know, other sports. So that's my feelings and thoughts on it. I think they're both beneficial. I think dumbbells are a great way of doing a lot of upper body lifts. I think they're, they're unique in the sense that you could, I, I know for myself, for somebody that doesn't have great thoracic mobility, that I can do overhead presses much better with a dumbbell than I can a barbell. And I think anything back related where you're pulling, anything with, in regard to symmetry and, and lifting dumbbells, you're better off with dumbbells versus barbells. Now, I'm not gonna say don't lift a barbell. I think there's a lot of benefits to barbells. It's just what I'm saying is don't be what I would call, what is the word, ideological Nazi. Do not do that. Because you're gonna find, you're gonna break your own rules at some point because you're gonna meet a client or even for yourself, you're gonna find a situation where, you know what, this is not the best thing for me right now. And you might have to try something different. And I really think they're both very beneficial. And I'd like to get into the weeds about how they are different and how both kettlebells and dumbbells have improved my level of fitness through my life course. And I know they have for you, especially. Okay. Um, so I guess for starters, I think for anybody, especially if you're trying to fill out your home gym, the, um, <laughs> the easiest way to make the decision is um, the cost and that one is easier to find than the other. So um, now that we're in this pandemic. <laughs> yes, it's a lot easier to find kettlebells. Because they're such, an, they're such a unique um, implement Obviously, yeah. that uh, they, in the market, you can find them slightly, I think they're a little, bo little bit more accessible, but it, today I was looking because uh, one of my clients is trying to get one. I couldn't get the one that I wanted or I wanted for him to get. So uh, it, it takes a lot of searching, but dumbbells, if you're trying to find and use dumbbells, like it, I find it to be hard at this point in time because that was one of the first things people started buying up next to toilet paper. It's next to impossible. <laughs> in fact, I sold a, a pair of Jovida, like, uh... yep these adjustable dumbbells that go from 10 pounds to I guess 50 pounds, I made like $500 on them. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you, I would, before the pandemic, the most I could have sold them for would, would have been what, 40 couple. bucks? Well, probably a couple hundred. You really think I'd have gotten 200 for them? Probably. Well, I was shocked how much I got. Now I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Um, 
the one time the, 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 the economics has benefited me. Like, you know, the flow of it. Right, because you have a, a, a surplus of equipment. Yeah, <laughs> right. So. Yeah, so basically um, a dumbbell will probably run you, I guess, in the average market, we'll say, um, somewhere maybe between $150 to $2 a pound. Um, they say that a kettlebell will run you about $1.90 per pound, but when I went and looked at my kettlebell of choice, which I know is on the expensive side, um, they were $3 a pound, and that doesn't even include shipping. So once you include shipping, it can it can be a really expensive. Um, you know, I, I remember several times I've ordered equipment for uh, Redwood City, yeah. like dumbbells, okay. and if you get the really lousy, like the hex kind, mm -hmm. um, they're not the nicest dumbbells. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, even to grab them, they just like rip your hands to pieces, but they're the cheapest. Yep. And I don't mind lifting them. I've got incredible calluses, I'm proud of them. <laughs> and uh, I, I've gotten them as much as, as low as 30 to 60 cents a pound. Wow. But that was okay. not now, of course, and that was probably about a decade ago, oh, half okay. a decade ago. Um, but I'm just shocked that I, I tried to look for those kind of dumbbells now, and they do sell them heavier. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like if you want some 100 pound hex dumbbells, which I'd seen them before, like a decade ago. You know, every now and then I just search weird items and that was one of them. And yeah, now it's like extremely expensive. For a 100 pound dumbbell, you know, you should have been able to get that for $100 each, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's like $450. And that may include shipping, but the point is, they're expensive now, like saying, say, even the lousy hex dumbbells that nobody likes to lift, they're a big money now. Yeah. I was thinking about getting them for work because it doesn't seem like anytime soon I'm going to be able to get to a gym. Yeah. Well, we'll keep looking. Yeah. <laughs> um, the second thing that I personally find beneficial about uh, kettlebells over dumbbells is um, grip. So you yes. want you want good. If your shoulder health is probably dependent on your grip health. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Um, so the difference is basically with the kettlebell, uh, well, at least the ones I use, because of course you could buy the, um, the kettlebell sport version where all of them are symmetrical, but I use the cast iron ones and basically the handle increases in girth based on the weight of the bell. So if you're gonna lift heavy, you better have good grip. <laughs> you know, I noticed that too saying, I don't do a lot of swings like you do. Yeah. But I have used kettlebells for so many different things, it, for rehab especially, like um, when I have a leg injury, <laughs> such as my knee injury I had during that rehab, the first thing I deadlifted on were kettlebells. And I remember how elated I was that I could deadlift a 45 pound kettlebell. <laughs> it sounds funny, right? But yeah, I remember thinking, yeah, I just did a 45 pound kettlebell. But the point is, the reason why it's so good to learn with a with a kettlebell is you can literally put it between your ankles. And unlike a barbell, you don't have to worry about the bar whacking your shins. You can really teach people how to use their hips properly and with a kettlebell. And I can recall several times I've been in a gym and I have just cringed at some of these trainers that put a bar on somebody's back that's not ready for it. Okay, we've already discussed Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, we've already discussed <laughs> we've that. We've already talked about Anyway, it. that's another tool that I like for kettlebells. Um, so, and actually, so two points to that. Yeah. Number one, um, that's the other thing about the, the handles is with a kettlebell, a lot of times, depending on the size, of course, but as a female, I can fit both of my hands on a kettlebell handle, on most kettlebell handles actually, um, starting at 10 kilos. So that's the great part. Uh, with dumbbells, it's one per hand. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, number two, the other thing when Scott mentions rehab, that's the other reason why personally I always favor a kettlebell over a dumbbell is it self teaches you like what where things should be and what the position is and that's why I love them um you know a couple weeks ago I was training one of my clients on uh the get up and you know he's his arm is facing one way and I'm like okay just pretend if you had that kettlebell in your hand 
Would you really want it like coming down, looking straight at your eyes? <laughs> or behind it. Or like, do yeah. you want to like basically, and that's the thing, if you crush that and you get into what we call shoulder packing, now the bell's off to the side and it's even safer because if that, if you lose control, all it does is go out to the side you and just let go of it. your yeah. face. And as for somebody who's actually dropped a 14 kilo kettlebell on themselves, um, that's just a quick lesson. You you know exactly where to put that kettlebell in order to avoid your face, your teeth, your eyes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so when I lost my kettlebell, I lost it straight on my stomach, which luckily, thank God, it didn't hit my hip bone. Um, it just went to my organs, so um, that was fine. Yeah, that's pretty scary. <laughs> but And also, um, from the rehab perspective, um, you know, where to put your shoulder, how to hold the bell, like you should be able to feel that more with a kettlebell just because the weight is resting on usually the outside or if you're doing bottoms up, now you have to balance it on your arm bones and if you drop it, all of a sudden the bell's gonna hit you. It's gonna probably come off to the side. So that's the one thing I really personally like from a rehab perspective and trying to teach people about weight is with the kettlebell because it teaches them a whole lot faster than as many times as I've tried to explain it to people with a dumbbell, it makes no sense. But as soon as I hand them the kettlebell and I say, hold it like this and see what happens, that takes care of, that's yeah, the best teacher. <laughs> I would agree. I think for grip strength and not only grip strength, but understanding the alignment of the wrist Kettlebells are excellent shoulder for position. that. Yeah, shoulder positioning, and it's all related. I think they're excellent for that. And one of the things I really like about kettlebells too, you can improve your stability with kettlebells. Like I said, you can do a deadlift with them. You can um, hold them with your elbows in what we call a goblet squat. Um, that's a great thing, a great tool for squats, especially if you're teaching somebody how to squat properly. Um, and great for rehab. Um, but you know, there are limitations. I mean, eventually you get to a point where you just can't hold enough weight there and, and squat. Same thing with dumbbells. That's where you need barbells. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of room for, uh, for multiple tools. They're all beneficial, but I think kettlebells are very unique in the sense that they can, use, they can be used in so many different ways that can be beneficial. And, and I think what we should do right here too is describe to everyone really the difference between stability and power yep. because for somebody who's just a lay person that's listening to this they have no idea what i'm talking about and you know we're talking about it like it's a casual thing but for many they're not even understanding what we're actually talking about because yep. what you'll oftentimes hear is wow did you see how much that guy benched look at the power he has and then i stop and go actually that's not really power that's stability and strength so basically strength, I'm gonna make it real simple. Strength is just the amount of weight you can lift, point blank. And no surprise, people that can lift a lot of weight have a lot of stability. They have a lot of stability in the shoulders, they have a lot of, a lot of stability in the hips, and they clearly have some mastery of their feet because so much of the strength that you develop is from the ground. Now, what makes kettlebells so great, in my opinion, is you can use them to increase your power. That's the speed in which you move heavy weight. And that's a whole different level. That's where you get to athletes. That's what athletes have to do. So when you see an athlete like Christian McCaffrey catch a pass out in the flat and makes a couple moves and guys run into each other and he just explodes down the field, that's power. That's power. Lowering his shoulder and running into a pile and moving it forward is strength and stability. Making a quick jump cut and, and taking off explosively and outrunning everyone is power. So one of the reasons why I got into um, basically doing all my exercises with kettlebells was um, the benefit of basically like ballistic training it falls under the same family as power. Um, and that was because um, that was supposed to help with me trying to prevent, or I mean, at this point, I don't even think it would prevent Parkinson's disease, but um, since that ran in my family, it was really important for me to work on ballistics so that I could just neuromuscularly keep training. Um, you know, so for me, it's always been about the body and brain connection. 
um, with it for exercise. So it's, you can't do it with, well, it's a little different with dumbbells. I mean, you could swing a dumbbell, sure, but it's, it's a, I mean, there's a whole different mechanic that Yeah, goes into and it's it. not their intended use, really. And I've seen people snatch dumbbells. It can be done, but it looks more like a squat to an explosive yeah. upward swing. It doesn't look like the snatch in the sense that how you do it with a kettlebell. Yeah, and that's which is more hip driven. Yeah, yeah. When, um, with kettlebells, that's the thing. Like, if you really teach yourself, like your center of balance, your center of power, you can use your center to move the weight. And it's not just everybody. You know, with dumbbells, they they move it. it everything's a shoulder, arm, you know, type thing. Um, for me, it's all. Can I generate enough power through my hips to push the weight um, that's already at the extension at the end of my hand mm -hmm. so it's not actually my shoulder or my arms doing the work they're just guiding it um, it should be coming from my hips and if it's coming from my hips hopefully it's coming from my feet and that's a good point you bring up saying because one thing I really learned uh, when when saying showed me a lot of these movements with the kettlebell is uh, paying close attention to your feet and stop me if I've mentioned this before in our podcast but I I think my feet were very dysfunctional, and I know they need a lot of work too, most presently. Most feet are. <laughs> but I think they're in a lot better shape than they were five years ago. And I used to deadlift, believe it or not, with like a lot of support. And once Sang got me um, tennis shoes that were, I'm not gonna say minimalist, but were half minimalist. And then finally, I just decided to kick my shoes off one day and do some deadlifts, and I was stunned difference I mean my feet feel stronger I used to have all kinds of problems with you know my plantar fascia my feet with uh, even with that flexor halogus which is let's use your cute little foot that tendon that runs under here this muscle um, that's what controls the big toey <laughs> and uh, yeah it was uh, I had a lot of problems there and being able to do deadlifts and squats without shoes definitely change my whole entire strength as far as my posterior chain is concerned. And what I mean is my butt, my hamstrings, my legs in general, the whole back half of my body got a lot stronger. And even before that, I thought I had pretty good strength in my posterior chain. Not, not at all like what I eventually have been able to develop since taking shoes off on these movements. So I credit you for that. And, strength is very important. Yeah, and that's a huge part of kettlebell training. Because if, if you've ever watched an Olympic lifter do a snatch, their feet leave the ground. However, if you ever watch a kettlebell person perform a, uh, a snatch, their feet are pushing off the ground the whole time. And that's a real big part of kettlebell training is making sure that you're fully grounded while you're developing power in your hips. Yeah, we got some pictures today. I'm gonna get out of the way here. One picture. We got one picture? <laughs> we got one picture. Whoops. Oh, or do you have a video? <laughs> that's a video from uh, Scott's. Uh... Oh, we don't wanna see that. <laughs> it's his training for, uh, for tendonitis that he's working on. We're not there yet. Yeah. Oopsie, there we go. So, uh, as I said earlier, um, I'm sure also in other podcasts, a lot of kettlebell work is all about physics and geometry. So this is always my favorite picture of Pavel. Um, so Pavel is basically who we talk about all the time. He started with Dragon Door and was the initial creator of my uh, the certification I went through for the Russian kettlebell. And then eventually he started his own organization with the Strong First. So these are his lovely pictures showing all the dynamics. Oh, look at all those angles. All those angles so, are pretty much the yep. same on, so the, this hip angle doesn't change much in when the bell goes to the back in the back swing. Um, but notice how nice and erect and straight up and down he is um, at the very top. And that's pretty much, how I cue a lot of exercises is being able to stack your entire spine. And that's for joint health and spine health too. Um, and then, you know, if you know how to use your hips, then you'll be able to 
push out weight and had no problem with that much. I don't even know how much. It kind of looks like 35 what, pounds. What is the red? Uh, that's, the, red that's the top. Okay. So top. that's the end of mm -hmm. the swing. Which you don't want to go above the shoulder, yeah. You, I mean, everybody's different. If you if you have that type of shoulder health, great. I personally have never met anybody whose shoulders can both be holding on to something and both be um, overhead. So that's kind of the, what Scott talks about, the downside of doing any type of military press when you're holding both hands with one implement. Um, most people I meet are not that symmetrical. So I personally have never done what we call the American swing, which is what most CrossFitters do. Oh, it's overhead, isn't it? It's overhead. Yeah. Um, I, if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna put weight overhead, I have way many other options. And in fact, earlier when we were talking about how you can learn about your body and the connection between your hip and the end of your fist. I mean, like doing windmills, if your hand is overhead and you now go down over to the side in a hinge, you'll feel the connection between having weight out, like right on top of your hip. I don't have a picture, but um, that's the thing. Like kettlebell can teach you a lot of angles, and that's pretty much what this picture is about, are angles on how we basically use the weight to connect with our center of balance for control. And you know, one of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm good. I was gonna say, one of the typical things that I, experience watching people move, especially when I'm trying to teach them how to hinge, um, I see too much movement in the knee yep. and not enough in the hip. And uh, what that looks like is just imagine for a minute if his hip wasn't bent mm -hmm. and the hip's straight but the knees are bent, mm -hmm. you know, the body's going to look kind of straight and the knees are going to be the only thing bending. Mm -hmm. And this, my friends, is why people wear their knees out and need knee replacements. Because if you're using your hips adequately, um, you are definitely protecting the knees. If you look at this angle here, the load is on the hip more than the knee. So everything has to work well with each other. If something's, uh, I would say, playing too much of a role or something else, another joint in your body's playing too little of a role, this is where you end up wearing things out and injuring yourself. So, I mean, like, that's the thing about the kettlebell is, like, once you cast one of these further out, you've got to be able to find a way to bring it back down, and that's a lot of ab work right there. And I would say, especially with kettlebells versus dumbbells, just picking up a kettlebell and trying to figure out what to do with it, that alone, I feel like people end up utilizing more muscles than they even realize they had. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Versus a dumbbell. I mean, I've seen people swing around dumbbells like, you know, they, they're like looking at it. Oh, this is easy. I can do this and that. And you're like, oh, yeah, try that with a kettlebell. Exactly. <laughs> kettlebell will teach you real fast that once it like bends your, um, your wrist, wrist you're like, oh, that really hurt. That's usually the, the thing that I always hear. And it's like, yeah, because you can't, you have to know what you're doing. You cannot just walk in there and grab a kettlebell and treat it like a dumbbell because not the same um, I mean that's just my own personal experience I feel but like I can easily take one kettlebell put it in the back of my car go do a workout and have all different kind I mean like I can do one arm push-up with one hand on the kettlebell now you know that take that helps me balance out um, I could never do that with a dumbbell I mean, with a dumbbell I'm always frightened whenever we do have you know students do stuff it's like okay be careful because that dumbbell might roll out of your <laughs> yeah if it's a larger dumbbell it's a lot different but when it's a smallish dumbbell or a moderate sized dumbbell it could definitely roll and get away from you yeah, yeah. well I think at any size uh, because of the hex on you know depending on what type of dumbbell you use um, I mean it could potentially be more hazardous versus a kettlebell you just flip it on its side put your hand down you can use it to everybody who has like carpal tunnel or what have you. They have something to help shape their wrist for them for support. So, I mean, there's just so many. And even the unique holds, like you can take the kettlebell and lift it from the bottom. And now you have no place to hold other than the, 
the grip that's inside of your palm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's so many different things you can work on with the kettlebell versus the dumbbell in those regards. Yeah, I think the fact that it isn't symmetrical is good because it really teaches you, well, what, what I mean is if you turn a dumbbell on its side, oh, it's gonna be yeah, yeah, bottom yeah. heavy, whereas a dumbbell, it's equal weight on, on both, both sides. sides. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's a placement. Of sounds it. great in, in nature, and it is good in, in many cases, but not good in every case because, uh, as we know, life isn't always symmetrical. Yeah. Sometimes you have to cut in a sport and something's running into you this way or whatever it may be, you know, you, every movement requires asymmetry, asymmetry at some yeah. point. Like you look at tennis players, you look at golfers, they swing one direction, so they need work the other direction. And that's a good thing about kettlebells, that they can be very beneficial for that. Yeah, and you know, on the topic of asymmetry, that's actually one of the ways that I've learned, um, like I've been able to teach my core how to work is because, I mean, I wasn't willing to, I mean, I'm willing to invest into a certain number of double kettlebells that are the exact same weight, but for the most part, my collection is they're not they're not doubles so there's one of each weight so i've had to learn how to exercise with one weight lighter than the other weight and it it, de it definitely teaches you a lot um i think when people think of dumbbells or it's always even on both sides and the torsion that happens when you have one bell if it's heavier and it pulls you in that direction or you've got to really balance more on the heavier side that I mean, you don't really learn like, okay, how do I balance, how do I feel this and really balance it out? Um, and that's the great thing that I think kettlebells taught me early on. And it's been great because, but the skill set that you get from that, like you can pretty much lift almost anything. I mean, like I've, at some point I've moved to mace, although I should do more mace work, but that's even more different because now you have a super long lever on, um, with the weight being on the other side, so. Um, but either way, I mean, in general, I don't know that most of our population would even be using the base. Anyway. Yeah, it's that's highly specialized. Yeah. True. Even though it's one of the older forms of. It really is, yeah. The older forms of fighting, actually. It, yeah, it's, bases are brutal. Not only do you swing them as a bludgeon instrument, but you hold them down low and you thrust them forward. Yeah, so. Yeah, you get a different whole. Different skill. You get a whole, a whole load of those guys in a row. That's, that's pretty lethal. Yeah, so uh, anything else you want to add about uh, kettlebells? Well, honestly, I can go on, but. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'd like to be respectful of our audience's time. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I think they're all beneficial. Um, like I said, kettlebells have a lot of uniqueness to them. And uh, I certainly use them for a lot of different um, skill sets. I think they're, they're, uh, they're a great tool for teaching. Um, I would never think of teaching a deadlift now without using a kettlebell. I mean, I think it's the smartest way to go. I wouldn't start someone on a bar. Same thing with a squat. I mean, I would start with a body weight squat. First, I always start with a deadlift because I think you have to learn how to use your hips and your feet. If you can't figure out how to do that, you're gonna have a lot of problems down the road. But that's the beauty of it. Once you teach somebody how to deadlift properly on a kettlebell, you teach them how to line their spine and their hips up properly, how to use their feet. Once they show promise there, you give them the kettlebell. Once they pass those tests and look stronger there, then you can give them a kettlebell and show them how to squat. But first, you always start with a bodyweight squat first and make sure the mechanics are good. Then you hand them the weight and their holding weight. And then you reach a point where that becomes pretty easy and that person's getting really strong. Then you can think about moving them on to a barbell and other tools such as maces. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, since we're going to talk about mace and stuff like that. So the other thing, like basically a swing is based on what we call a pendulum movement. And the other great thing that kettlebells can take you into that a dumbbell cannot or does not quite happen that way is um, like doing kettlebell flow. So you're um, working 
and just feeling the flow and catching, um, it's a, a catching activity, yeah. <laughs> I find. Um, you don't find many people who do it, but I think like neurologically, I mean, it's high stimulus, I find, which is why I don't do it very often. Um, but I do think it's fun. Uh, if I weren't wanting to have like a kettlebell play day, that would probably be where I would go. But super advanced, I, I mean, you have to, I mean, that, that, that skill set I find, it's highly advanced because you have to know what to expect on the other side or, or at least be able to feel and respond really well, which is much different from like the kettlebell training I'm used to. But, you know, there's but, always stuff to work on. But yeah, exactly, always, right? No matter how good a shape you're in, there's always things to work on. Also, um, I noticed when you're doing kettlebell swings or snatches, the way you you transfer the bell from one arm to the other yeah. is very interesting. It's between the legs, you know, on the way down, bring the other hand over and then it pops back up. Or do you do it at the top? Do it at the top. Okay, yeah. The top. Um, so that's another thing um, from a neurological side, like knowing like when to catch. Yeah. Um, it's a skill. I mean, otherwise you're either going to ruin your floor or you're going <laughs> to potentially... It's going to go out um, of your hands, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we teach pancake in order to do the transfer for people who've never done it before. But I, I know for me, like being able to alternate hands and just let go of the bell, but be ready to catch with the other. Um, that's something that the kettlebell, I think, far exceeds the dumbbell. Um, but also, I did forget to mention, because you talked, when you were talking about power, mm -hmm. I started talking about Parkinson's, but you're... Even for your older adult as you age, um, you know, I think they say somewhere between 30 and 40, closer to 40, we start losing our muscle mass. But um, even faster than that, we lose our power ability. Um, so that's being able to, for me, uh, in your everyday activity, it's being able to react. I mean, because I don't know how many times I've had to run to catch a plane, and if I didn't have enough push in me to carry all my bags and, yeah. and like catch that plane it wouldn't happen um i mean and even then it's just being able to react quickly um loaded with all of your stuff um goes to that power training and not only that to move explosively yet be stable yep requires the combination <laughs> of stability and power actually right? we were talking about that this week uh, we we were talking about um, somebody who fell over because I guess they bumped in, somebody bumped into them and he had just had a hip replacement or something, right? Yeah, yeah correct. So um, it's the same type of thing. Like if I'm going to have to run through the airport with all of my stuff and people, and if I can't move properly and get out of their way, yeah. <laughs> they go ahead and just run right into me. Hopefully I can just take that and keep running. <laughs> Because yeah. it happens. I mean, I've I've walked through San Francisco <laughs> with without stuff, and I've been definitely pushed enough times. So you know, luckily I've never fallen off of any of those pushes. Yeah, that's that's a whole nother topic right there. <laughs> huh? Riding riding public transit in the city. Yeah. Wow, that's where it benefits you to stay in shape. Yeah. Because sometimes you got to deal with blow. <laughs> I have been. I have. Been, <laughs> Going through the middle of the city, people have used me as the <laughs> as basically the bar in the middle of the uh, bus, which is not a good idea because I'm only five feet tall. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand that. That's like an invasion of personal space to me. Yes. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Anything else to add? Uh, nope. I think that's everything. All right. So hopefully, hopefully that answered all the questions you had about dumbbells versus kettlebell. I don't want to. I don't want to portray this as a competition. They're both very beneficial. It's just they're unique and they're tools. And I think they're tools that you need to learn how to use properly that you can definitely use to get to the next level of your strength, your power, your stability. Definitely. All right? So go out and get a kettlebell. Go get your dumbbells. <laughs> do your dumbbell presses. Do your kettlebell deadlifts, your swings. Well, don't learn swings until you've had a trainer teach you how to properly use them. 
and I would use somebody like saying it's RKC certified or somebody who's been tutored one way or another by Pavel's uh, theory or Dan John's theory on uh, using kettlebells in hip movements, okay? You don't want to hurt your lower back. You can hurt it if you don't know how to properly um, you know, use the uh, kettlebells, especially on a swing. You can really wreck your back if you're not moving in the hip and you're just moving in your spine. That's all I have to add on that, okay? All right, everyone, I hope you had a great time today and learned something. Um, I forgot to mention, please like the video if you like it and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done that yet. We're trying to build the uh, channel to a wider audience and we're get slowly getting there. <laughs> all right, everyone, take care and have a good rest of your weekend.